someone who won't take shit from Axel. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That last one. He, he... Somebody who won't take shit from Axel. And I'm like, I <laughs> go there's good, two Andy. people. I go there's two people that, that I can think of, and one definitely ain't doing it. And he's like, well, who? I said, Zach Wild and me, and I ain't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> are we rolling? We are. So give me a scorpion's memory, Snake. 1984, Bon Jovi was opening up for the Scorpions. And I drove out to Hershey, Pennsylvania. And it was this little, almost like a minor league baseball stadium or something like that. And of course, I'm, you know, John's my buddy and all the guys are my buddies. So I go there and I'm, of course, I'm like, you guys are great, you guys are great to Bon Jovi guys. And so I'm like, I'm gonna catch the Scorpions because I've loved them since, gosh, I first discovered them probably in 76, 77, Tokyo Tapes, and the first live record they did, and uh, Virgin Killer, and so those earlier records, and this, with, you know, I forget what record sales. Lee Roth records. Yeah, oh, Sales of Sharon. I mean, my gosh, it's still timeless, you know? I still can't play it after 20-some years. <laughs> but, uh, so I watched the Scorpions from the side of the stage, and I was absolutely, blown away. I, I never saw a band like that tight and that <coughs> professional, if you will. Like, as I, I was telling Paul earlier, when we did the Moscow Music Peace Festival, I was in awe on the side of the stage. They were just, they were really smart. Before you had in-ears, they had everything dialed in so perfect. Whereas we, you know, and everybody else just had walls and marshals and, and whatnot. And they just, they had everything low. I'm like, oh man, this can't be a rock band. And it sounded pristine. And I was like, man, thank God we didn't go on after them. That's one of the great things about these guys. They're so smart. You know, they're such veterans. You yeah. Know? And, and it, it's funny because, you know, we came along later, I, you know, Skid Row and, and uh, with my group Extreme at the time. I mean, they were already the sort of, you know, the veteran guys. Oh, yeah. There, you know, it's, it's amazing for me now being involved on the management side. Um, and you know what Snake's saying is is sort of indicative. You know what they say: how you do anything is how you do everything. Right. You know what he's that's saying great. about the lower stage volume. Yeah. It's it's sort of that's like a, a thread through you know meetings with this band. You know when when we sort of make decisions about what will happen next here in the states. It's it's always done from the right place. They're really really good smart bunch of guys and fun to be around. I was going to say they're really fun to be around. Yeah. So there's some kind of German engineering going on here because. Rudolf started this group really in the mid '60s. Was, was it that early? Yeah, and he was like a teenager. So, do the math, and then understand that there's something about that whole aspect of are they doing things like are they higher up on the curve? I would say technology so. Technology curve. Well, I mean, I remember the first knowledge I had of them was again like the mid '70s. But I remember they they had a video for a song from 1974 that I just recently saw on YouTube with Michael Shanker playing. And it was, it was like this trippy, almost like a Pink Floyd parochial harem thing or something. And I was like, this is no way is this a Scorpions. And, and I played it for people in my office. Oh, I gotta go find that. Oh, it's classic, man. I mean, the people in my office, because we worked with the Scorpions in the past too. Doc, you know, Doc worked with the Scorpions. And, the people who, were, who worked with the Scorpions were like, there's no way that's Klaus. Because he's not even singing, he's kind of preaching. Like, almost like a Morrison thing. Right. And I would say he's beard and mustache and stuff. I'm like, no! It's funny over the, it's multi-generational, how, you know, how the scene has changed, you know, and they've hung on and done their thing successfully right through it. And I, I work with uh, Billy Corgan. Yeah. And uh, one day I mentioned, oh, geez, uh, you know, tomorrow I'm having dinner with the Scorpions. They're, they're coming in town. He's like, oh my God, you're kidding. He's like, oh, oh you, yeah. you gotta introduce me. Like he was so excited about it, you know. So you know, we ended up going down. Uh, at least I, I think it was uh, Rudolph came down with me to the to the studio, and it was funny to watch Corgan, who was you know major star in his own yeah, his own right, and, sure. and uh, he was just so like enamored and happy that that he he was meeting and talking with him. Don't you think so, that's part of what? why this time now we're in 2010 but the bands that the people really want to go see are the ones that are our generational <coughs> groups they're taking their kids and those songs are what last oh right? my gosh yeah i mean i was 16 years old playing songs off animal magnetism <coughs> you know and then and then uh and love drive and 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 of course 
uh, blackout. And I mean, as a young guitar player, to me, like listening to those just from a guitar solo standpoint, I mean, it was nearly untouchable. And, and it, it was around the same time where everyone was discovering Randy Rhodes and, and Eddie Van Halen prior. And all of a sudden, you've got you know guys like Michael Shanker and, and Matthias, who I think Matthias is one of the most <laughs> underrated guitar players in the world. Always said that because his, not only is his technique amazing, he's got soul, which you notice with a lot of European guitar players. The more technically adept and they are, soulful, the majority. Yeah, soulful noodlers are hard to come by. And his tone, I mean, his tone <laughs> is always spot on, and it's recognizable. Like when you hear his guitar tone on on the radio or whatever, you know it's him. And that very few people have that, you know? <coughs> kind of interesting, like back in the day when radio used to be such a hybrid of sounds, you know, to back in the 70s, when, I mean, when, when album radio came, yeah. you could hear like, you know, bizarre meetings of, you know, Yes and, mm -hmm. you know, Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer, yeah. something totally pop on the other end on the same station. And then that changed and fragmented it all apart, but now, in my opinion, so sort of iTunes brought it together for our, you know, yeah. the next generation, our kids, because they're discovering My Chemical Romance and the Scorpions in the same portal yeah. right there. So that for them, it's not really a date necessarily, but it's something else to listen to that they're finding through this. Yeah. You know, and it's a real test now because it's all in that place. And, you know, you know they always say it's funny, like, for parents, they looked on, ah, when I was a kid, the music, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, hey, now it's coming off through the, through the same place. Yeah, and we have an arrogance about it. I'm like, I have this Beatles, Stones arrogance. Yeah, I was there. I watched Ed Sullivan. I have a kiss arrogance. And you have a kiss <laughs> you know, that, that was your, you know, Gene told me this, you know, 20 years ago. Well, that, that was my inspiration. There's no kiss without the Beatles. Oh, yeah. Without he just cartooned the Beatles. Oh, of course they did. You can yeah. tell when they sing back and forth, Paul and Gene, that's straight John and Paul. What in Germany do you think, in, I'll ask them, but what was inspiring those guys to do that kind of music in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, as kids? I don't have a clue. You might have a better clue. You know, the Beatles started in Hamburg. That's yep. where they get gigs more than anything. Maybe, you know, that's a thing to ask Rudolph, which I'm going to. I mean, I've interviewed Scorpions before, but I never like went way back. That's interesting. I don't know. You might have a more of a clue than I do. <coughs> oh, are you kidding? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's you know You're from before Boston. before my time. <laughs> yeah. do and you know Everything what? Everything goes back to Aerosmith tr working out, uh, rehearsing in the women's gym at Boston University. <laughs> Which? Yeah, well, for me, they were sort of, uh, having been born and raised in Boston, Aerosmith was like the Led Zeppelin of our, yeah. oh my of gosh, our, yeah. our city, yeah. you know. Yeah, we didn't have anybody in Jersey. <laughs> that only came later. <laughs> was Free Springsteen? Oh, it, was, it wasn't Working Spring, class? It was, for me, it was a new wave of British heavy metal. That's yeah. what turned my life around, yeah. along with Kiss. I mean, you know, there was... It was Priest and Maiden. Oh, yeah. Angel Witch and Tigers of Pentang and, and Samson and Diamond Tank. Head. You know, uh, I mean, Venom, you know, bands Venom. like... Venom. Oh, yeah. All bands that were in Rip Magazine. Yep. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, for, we didn't have anybody in Jersey, really. The closest thing that we had was the New York Dolls, which I was never into. Yeah, but Kiss came along yeah. around one year after Who that. Who Tyler worshipped. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, he stole his chick. Stole Jordan, yeah. Yes, I mean, he I did. I got these stories from the, from the lips themselves. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. You guys, that's it. Okay. Thank Great. you.